welcome back to the From Field to Plate podcast. I'm Jeremiah Dowdy, and today I'm sitting here with uh, another class full of dudes that are here to take from Field to Plate University class, uh, as well as Matt and Cody with West Texas Outfitters. We're using their uh, facilities down here in Comstock. So this is actually our third day of actually being here. We haven't had a chance really to come in and do the pre-podcast, so we're doing this before we have a chance to get in there and skin. We have three of the four deer down. Not for lack of trying. Chris, our bow hunter, has been out early and late every single day trying to get him. Um, he just has a squeaky chair. So um, <laughs> if you know, you know. So we're going to kind of go around the table. You guys can say uh, your name, where you're from, and then we'll kind of talk about why you guys want to take the class, what's the purpose of it in, in your own mind, and kind of just chit-chat for a little bit about the whole process before we get into that uh, shed. You guys have already done skinning and gutting. So kind of if we'll talk about that too, like what are some things you learned? Cause some of you have hunted for a long time. Some of you, it was your very first bigger than a duck that you've killed. So um, we'll kind of, we'll kind of go along that way. If you hear sipping of coffee, that's also Chris cause he's got squeaky chairs and loud cups. I'm, so I'm just loud. So we'll go ahead and we'll start with Chris <laughs> since he's the loudest one here uh, and the bow hunter. So where are you from name, all that good jazz. Oh, hey, my name's Chris. I'm from Southern California. I'm the squeaky chair bow hunter guy. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. Anything Sweet. Else you want to hear? No, we'll just keep moving down the line. Going wide later. <laughs> uh, I'm Eric. I'm from Corona, California. Um, here with probably the best from field to play class mm. ever. <laughs> third, um, third best ever. One was one was all girls. It was fun. Okay. <laughs> that's this class. Yeah. <laughs> all girls. Same. Yeah. All right, we'll just keep going around the table. All right, I'm Matt. I'm with West Texas Outfitters, and I'm from Houston. And I am Cody with West Texas Outfitters, and I, too, am from Houston. I am Jeremy. I'm from uh, Denton, Texas. I'm Matt number two, and I'm from Denton, Texas. And Matt and I just found out that we're brothers. Yes. So, <laughs> long that? story. Long story. We'll tell you guys later. So, um, what we're going to do from now is kind of anybody can jump in where they want to jump in, but... What made you want to take a from field to plate class? Because I don't know if you guys know this, but at this class, one of you is 401. So you were the last one to sign up, Jeremy. So you're the 401st person that's gone through a from field to plate class in the past five years. So I've taken out a ton of new and veteran hunters. Um, and so it's, I really enjoy hearing why people want to take the class. Um, I've, I've had heart surgeons who have taken the class, who, you know, the number one heart surgeons in New York. And I've had ex-vegans take the class. So kind of interested where where and why you guys want to take this class and what's the purpose of what you guys want to get out of this whole class um, now that you've done, like, you know, half of the class already. So whoever wants to start, go for it. Kind of just give us that why. Uh, for me, it was just uh, to broaden my horizons, broaden my knowledge of uh, what you can do with the animal, you know, for – a lot of us, I guess, especially down here in the South, we, you know, historically use processors and whatnot, and you get your burger and your grind and, you know, steaks, and but there's so much more to it. Um, so to taking the time to actually learn that and learn what you can do and how to do it and that kind of thing is, is what I'm after. Awesome. Yeah, for me, it was just uh, get out with a bunch of different guys from different areas, learn the way they hunt, maybe add a few more tools to my toolbox and the way I do things or, you know, have some guys tell me, like, you know, tighten up that chair, spray some WD on it. <laughs> and, uh, like I said, just, you know, add more arrows to my quiver, you know, and see what we can do with it. Meet some new friends and go from there. Yeah, for me, I, I've never deer hunted before. I've never got any large game animals. I've done a lot of hunting over the years. Just this is something I've never done before. And just, I don't know, I've all... I followed you online for a number of years and just thought, hey, this is something I'd really like to do. Somebody that appreciates the animal like I do. Um, I just, all of it's extremely fascinating to me. Like the whole gutting process yesterday, like I, <laughs> I felt like a 12 year old kid. You said it like, <laughs> you know, like a little 12 year old kid. I feel like a little kid. You That's know? exactly what it's about. Yeah. Middle aged fat guy. And over here, you know, just, it's just so much fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, the trigger pull is great. Everybody, everybody thinks that's the great part about it, and it, there's just so much more to it. 
Same here. It's just I'm used to everybody else cleaning my deer. You know, did pay hunts for a long time and uh, wanted to learn more. And there's uh, the, like you said, after the trigger pull, the learning all that stuff is, there's, it's awesome. And learning the different cuts, learning everything about it. It's, it's cool. And I think for, you know, two of you, you were talking about, you guys have a lease, you guys hunt and all this other stuff. But when we're even skinning, it was a whole new mm-hmm. aspect to it. Even though you've shot deer, you've killed deer, you've got a deer, you know, you've taken the back straps out. There's this different style. And, I, and I've said it to you guys, you know, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's a better way. There are some people that do stuff. And I'm like, that just doesn't seem right. But to them, that's how they do it. Um, but teaching you guys like the mechanics of how not to use loppers, you know, how many guys just go grab out loppers and cut off that head, but how easy was it to find that vertebrae that attaches to the, the skull and actually, you know, get it off in a clean cut in a beautiful way. Um, that just, I don't know, every aspect of that respects the animal. And by, by that getting down to that skull and to that, you know, that vertebrae that goes into the, the skull itself, you've now guaranteed you've gotten all the neck meat. A lot of the guys will go halfway down and just lop that off, and they've, they've left a pound of neck meat in the hide to throw in their gut bucket. So, um, awesome. So let's kind of go around and just, I don't know. I mean, Matt and Cody can, can jump in too, but where, just yesterday, like we did, or you know, the past few days we've done skinning and we've done um, the gutting. So what are some things you learned, or especially you, Eric, because you're brand new, what are some things that kind of, were different in what you expected in, in gutting and skinning. And then for the brothers that have done it for a while, what are some things that you learned in that gutting and skinning process that other people who are listening to this podcast maybe didn't know or are struggling with themselves that you've been struggling with that you saw an easier way to do it. Um, kind of just go from there and think about that whole gutting and skinning process and what you got out of it and what, you know, what's that little nugget of information that you took. I was really surprised at how clean it is. Because everything that I've ever heard about skinning deer is people are taking a hatchet and cutting, you know, in between the um, the pelvic bone, in between the pelvic bone, you know, cutting that in half. But you can't hit the bladder, and if you do hit the bladder, then you waste all that meat. And just the way that, yeah, sometimes you get in your face too, (laughs) (laughs) or in your mouth. But just the way that you showed us how to do it, I love the way it tastes. You know, I, I was really surprised at how clean it was. And then as you're doing, I mean, you're gutting, so you, it's, you do get blood on yourself. You do get it messy. It smells a little bit. And I was also surprised at how much I learned about the anatomy of the animal itself and how much destruction a bullet really does inside of a body. Like, the heart of mine is just, like, three-quarters. obliterated. Yeah, completely destroyed. You know, three-quarters of it is gone. Um, the exit wound, it blew out the joint of the other leg, and it was just crazy how powerful these rifles really are and how much destruction it does in the body you know to see how like the lungs just liquefied and i I don't know that skinning part i really or the gutting part i learned a lot yeah you know i thought it was going to be a lot more difficult just from what people have told me how skinning go or cutting goes and yeah it was the way that you do it is it's crazy how easy it is. Jeremy and I stayed up talking about it last night about the difference in, you know, the hanging method with, with your gutting versus doing it on the ground, field dress style, and how when you do it on the ground, you tend to have more blood around. But if it's hanging, I mean, you've got you've got it head down, right? So all the blood's going to go straight through the trachea down out the mouth. Where if you're doing that on the ground, you know, once you do the poop shoot, you're, you're cutting the whole lining out and everything. You reach in there to his trachea, you cut it and pull it. Well, that's where all the blood is sitting. After you shoot it, you know, it's full of blood. So all that comes in to the cavity and, and sits there. All the meat's protected still at this point, but it's not as clean and tidy as hanging it up. And I, we grew up out here gutting our deer in the field. So I only knew one way until heat came out so you know what was that like three years ago yeah y'all came out and we had never done it hanging up like that was the first and you do you end up with blood not head to toe because i have a problem with that when it's laying down i have it in my face it's in my beard 
on the back of my head and my hair. It's it's everywhere, but it's fun. Yeah, no, and that's and that's what I try to tell people all the time is too. It's the mechanics of it are the same if you think about the whole process, but on the ground it is going to be more bloody because everything's laying. So even if you have that frontal shot that's going in, you still have it protected by a diaphragm. Once that diaphragm is cut, everything that is blood wise inside that frontal half of that diaphragm up from your, you know, your, your sixth rib cage all the way up to the throat, all that's going to go back in. But it's, it's really easy because you just grab two legs, you flip it over on its, you know, on its belly and all the blood comes out and you can go right back at your day. Um, but it it does get a lot messier if you are a little back farther and you hit that gut shot or that, that liver shot. That's why when we try to teach, it's like, hey, I mean, I told Eric, Eric, I told you exactly where to shoot. Where did I tell you to shoot? There's a little triangle behind the front shoulder. Right. And he shot there and blew the heart out exactly. You know, he was about three inches off from the top of that triangle. But the heart sits within four inches of that, that little triangle. And so it's crazy when you actually look at the mechanics of a deer or an elk or a jackrabbit, right? They're all set up the same and once you understand that you can really give those proper shot placements be it a bow be it a rifle be it whatever and minimize the meat damage because we had with mats you know it was more of like a forensic show <laughs> when we came in because the hole was so massive and there was like it looked like buckshot on the side of it we go back and look and he actually had nicked a little chunk the bullet hit a little you know chicken wire and spun the bullet and shrapneled it into this deer. And so for then, then you can kind of see the difference. And so, yeah, some of that shrapnel got into that gut cavity. Even though it was a perfectly placed shot, some of that ballistics damage went into. But, yeah, even the ballistics damage, when you guys open up those shoulders, how much of that coagulation and that ballistics damage is in there? And So did you guys learn anything in the gutting or skinning process that was kind of that aha moment or that nugget of? Yeah, I mean, it's good just to get experience with it from somebody who knows and has done it a lot more than we have. I mean, again, I go back to, you know, for, for most of the people where I'm from is, you know, they don't take the time to do that. It's clean it in the field, throw it in the back of the truck, and take it to the processor, and they don't touch it until they're putting it on their hamburger. So, yeah, I mean, get, getting inside the deer, being able to look at it, I think it gives you a good education on, you know, like you said, the anatomy. You know, how do I place this shot if he's quartering away or two, you know, that type of thing. So... It's, uh, it's, I think you have to, you know, it, in my opinion, you know, I try to be as ethical as I can uh, when I take an animal and, and getting that knowledge uh, and, and growing that knowledge is, is always a part of that. Awesome. So tonight we're going to, or, or actually right after this podcast, we're going to get into the actual butchering process of the animals and doing all the cuts. And the specialty cuts and everything else that's going into uh, putting on your guys' plates. What are some things that you guys want to get out of that? What are some 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 aspects of that that you're curious about, you're excited about, that you're nervous about, you're frustrated about when it comes to actually doing it all yourself, like hands on, butcher down that animal? To piggyback off of that, I want to like toss into that answer because it it kind of goes with it, but. When you've done this in the past, what have you struggled with in the process, like that Jeremiah could show you a easier way around it instead of keep that to yourself and then he shows you and then it might answer it, but put it on the table. Like what, what have you struggled with in it already that you know is not the easiest for you or want to know see if there's an easier way? What's something like that 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 you've got? The gutting process for me has became a lot easier. Um, again, I've had other people do it for most of my hunts, and then uh, I've past couple years been doing it myself. But this this way of doing it is so much cleaner, easier, and quicker. To be honest, um, so that's the biggest thing I've taken away so far is is that process. And I think it's funny when you talk about. I know we're talking about the cuts, but when you when you start to understand it like even gutting on the ground when matt shot two antelope in wyoming right and we were all there together all the guys walk over to see that first antelope i walked over to one had it gutted upside down and ready to go by the time that they had finished walking over to see matt's first one and one of the guys like oh don't cut it we want pictures i was like it's already done <laughs> like 
I can gut a deer in, you know, three minutes, a minute and a half because you understand it. And so like a lot of guys sit there and struggle and struggle and struggle, plus having the right tools for it. You know, I love the Havilon. I love the silverware. I love all those little interchangeable blades. But the problem is you have a little two inch blade trying to do work through an animal and they're razor sharp. And so you can touch, you can gut, you can ruin all this other stuff. Having the proper tools for that. Like I showed you guys that bolt tip knife. That thing's amazing. Game changer. I mean, that sucker cut right through ribs like it was butter. And you can really cut that open, but also getting in there and putting that in there and going straight down. And on the ground, it's even easier because you literally just pull up and it goes all the way to the rib cage. So hopefully we'll get one on the ground today and we can show you the whole process of how that knife works out there. But getting back to like, what are you excited about in the butchering process of it, you know, in itself? Like once we get in there in a little bit with knives and the, the meat on the tables, like what are you excited about or nervous about or, you know, want to learn in that aspect? It's all exciting to me, you know. It's all it's brand new. So this is, I I actually think I'm in a really good place because I've never done this before, so I can see how it's done properly. Somebody that knows all the cuts that can show you how to do dissect everything and cut it up and well, like we were talking about vacuum processing, vacuum packing yesterday. He said, "Don't wash your meat and then vacuum pack it wet." That's how I've always done it, and I know I've ruined a bunch of meat by doing it still ate it because I shot it, but you know, I think I'd, going forward, I'll have a lot better results with ducks or hopefully more deer. Yeah, there you go. You know, Absolutely. elk, whatever. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of hooked now. I told my wife, she's in, <laughs> she's in trouble. You know. Oh, the season just got a little bit yeah. longer. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like I'm buying a bigger <laughs> rifle. New budget. You know. I leave September 1st and get home <laughs> March 31st. Well, years ago, she used to joke with people that she was a widow during hunting season because I was literally gone every weekend and I got away from it, you know, kids and whatever. And now I found something that I'm not good at, at least in my opinion, I'm not good at this and I need to learn how to do it. So I'm like, like, babe, you're in trouble. <laughs> Get all the way in. <laughs> I'm going. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I want to explore the, you know, the different cuts, the, you know, the, there's so much more to the deer that you can do instead of a hamburger, you know, like you're talking about the ground roast and the T-bones and things like that. You can actually get off a piece of venison that, you know, most people have never seen, never heard of. Uh, on top of the fact that I'm really excited more about getting my deer back, you know, taking it to the processor. Most of them, you're not getting your meat back, you know, so I, I try to take as good care as I can of the animal once I harvest it. But I don't know if Jim Bob down the street does the same thing and if it's been sitting in the back of his truck for two days or whatever. So knowing I'm getting my animal that only I'm going to be able to touch, you know, it's only our hands on it before it gets on our plate is is cool. And it's something, you know, from somebody who's kind of self-taught hunting, uh, I want to be able to instill that in my kids because they're coming up now. They're wanting to start hunting and I want them to know that right off the bat, you know, and not go through the 10 to 15 years that I've gone through. Um, and being able to, you know, take that animal, honor that animal, and, and, and do it upright versus, you know, just, you know, around taco meat. Yeah. Well, what I guess the question is to you, Matt, is what are the cuts that you're usually getting? Like when you're taking your deer in, what are you getting from them, the processor wise? Because that'll kind of help me understand, you know, you know, what you, because if, if anyone hasn't taken deer to a processor, they give you a little sheet. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, go ahead and fill out what you want. And you're like, click, 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 click. Okay, guess. And then that, that's what you get back. And like Matt was saying, you most of the time you're not getting your meat back because they're just like, all right, well, we've already got this ground chuck. We're going to go and throw that in there. Oh, okay, we've already got these sausages made. Oh, we've already got meat sticks made. And then they're, they're using your deer for six, seven, eight guys behind you because that's just the mechanic. It's, it's not that it's wrong. It is. But that's just how it's been done for so long, and that's what got me out of doing it. You know, many of you have heard the story about when I was in Wyoming and hunting antelope and took it to a processor and I put slices in all the steaks and all the roasts and all the, then I got it back and opened the package. I'm like, this isn't my meat. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's impossible because the meat can't heal itself, <laughs> you know, especially that fast. And so what are the, what are some of those check boxes that, you know, you and your brother check when you guys go into a processor? I mean, it, it really changes from processor to processor because each of them are kind of different what they offer. I mean, your basics are, you know, cutting your back straps into steaks or thirds, or do you want them butterflied and tenderized for chicken fry or 
things like that. I mean, for the most part, I mean, you get your steaks, your roasts, um, you know, ground, and then you got into your, you know, most processors have two or three choices of sausage, you know, uh, and then grind, add fat, no fat, you know, and then you get you know where that fat's coming from and all that. So, I mean, it's, it's very basic, uh, in my opinion, what you get back from them. Uh, you know, you can get things like tamales and pre-made hamburger patties and whatnot, but, uh, and then again, it gets very expensive. Um, you know, the more customized you want the meat, the higher the dollar is on it. You know, you could take a dough in there and end up spending 250 bucks on it and getting sausage and breakfast sausage and whatnot versus just doing it at home, I'm sure is, is much more cost effective. Which is crazy to think about because we did, well, we did 20 something deer in yeah. February. Yeah. And to think about an average, because we made breakfast sausage, breakfast sausage links, ground, snack we sticks. made snack sticks, we made jerky chorizo. sticks, we made chorizo, we made summer Brats. sausage, Brats. we made bratwurst, two different types of bratwursts. Yeah. Um, what, 200 and something pounds of ground, ground. steaks, crown yeah, cuts, bone-ins. And it was, it's funny to think about if you were to go in there, $200 per animal, you can buy the best processing equipment that's out on the market. Yeah. And even for you guys, you know, you, at, at, at your least, maybe you're shooting, what, three, four deer, mm -hmm. you know, deer a year. That's still two, four, six, eight, that's $800. You can get a kick-ass grinder for 400 bucks and a really really good avid armor you know sealer for another 300 bucks and you never have to pay that processor again and most of these you grinders are bags. yeah <laughs> and and most of these processors or these vac these grinders are coming with sausage attachments where mm -hmm. they've got where you can put your different casing your your different nozzles for your different casings me personally i love it because you can go you know i've got a, a foot pedal you can turn it off and on otherwise you're like okay you need to use two people but then again, you can also get the, you know, the, the, the tower stuffers, which those are cheap. Those are like 125 bucks and it holds 25 pounds of meat and you just crank it, As sausage, twist it, crank it. And so people are so intimidated by it. And I think you guys can probably piggyback on this is people are scared to, to screw up, right? Mm -hmm. You're scared to ruin it. You spend all this time, all this effort, all this money on procuring an animal. You don't want to screw it up. You don't want to make that wrong cut. And you'll hear me say probably a thousand times in the class today, it's just another meatball. It's just, mm -hmm. if you mess up on that cut, your family's still going to eat it. Yeah. It's still going to go in the, you, you can go in the grind pile. And it's crazy to think about you saying backstraps into steaks and backstraps into butterfly. And the backstrap is so much more than, you know. Poppers and than, rapids. Yeah, than, right. than, than, really? than, thin, than thin cut steaks. And, like, I would never use a backstrap for chicken fried steak. Like you use ch chicken fried steak and going through that masher is for those tough cuts, like that's like the bottom round or, you know, some parts of that sirloin. That's what's going to go through that masher to give it all, you know. But it's just, it's crazy too because everyone says the same thing. It's, well, this is just how, how I learned. This mm -hmm. is how Papa did it. This is how whoever did it. And for me, it's like I grew up bird hunting. I didn't have that. Oh, this is how so and so did it. And so it was a, it was a force to get into it. So, but and you still have to put faith in the process of the guy you're paying. I mean, I, I've had instances where I've, you know, taken things in and they've come out wrong. I mean, once they're done, they're done. You know, shot a black buck doe one time, took it in and got all these cuts made out of it, went to pick it up and it was a hundred percent ground, you know, not what I ordered, you know, but you can't go back, you know, so it's, uh, you know, I would rather take the chance with myself making a mistake than paying somebody else to screw up, and I still have to pay them. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. I wouldn't have paid him. There would have been a fight in the in the parking <laughs> lot. You um, just don't know how they're treated there either. I mean, once they're on the hook, or you know, I've dropped an elk off at one, and it sat in the floor with a bunch of high school kids, and you know, I told myself I was like, this isn't going to end good. And then you know, I dropped it off late at night one night, and and when we picked it up, I mean, it was unedible. I mean, it was just horrible tasting. You know, I don't, you can't guarantee it was my meat to begin with, but uh, just whatever they did and how they let it sit or whatever, it was just, you know, hundreds of dollars is down the drain. Uh, and I just, I don't want to repeat those kind of mistakes anymore. Yeah, and it's, you'll see a lot of times you go to these processors, you know, during opening antelope, opening elk, even in some of these areas, local places here in Texas, when it's opening deer season, 75 deer get dropped off mm -hmm. that first day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're all hanging with the hide still on them. Now, it'll take them a good 
day to just get the hides and those animals out. And then what they're doing is they're just cutting off. They're literally cutting, cutting off the every animals. single cut and they're stacking them up in a pile. Just mm-hmm. an assembly line. And it's like, okay, here are all the back straps. Okay, this guy ordered four back straps. Wrap four back straps. In you know, and so it's. Again, there are butchers out there that I respect and who do a phenomenal single deer process. They cost a lot more. Um, there's some old timers who are still doing it the way, but a lot of these young kids who want to make a ton of money, they're just like 250, 250, 250. And then if you get it, you know, sometimes you'll shoot a big ho- hog, you know, you're paying your minimum of 200. And then they're like, well, it's $100 every 100, you know, every 50 pounds over the, the weight limit. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it's a different world when you get into looking at the processing itself and looking beyond it because even for me I still there's I'm still buying books and I'm still you can ask Matt and Cody I'm still calling going I just read this you know watch this video I just I just looked at I found it we're gonna try this next next time I'm out there and we did that last time and worked beautifully you know and there's these there's these different processes like I'll look at stuff the, the video he's talking about I sent a video from 1946 of these sheep farmers cutting different parts of sheep and it's a lost method that's n- you don't you can't even google it and find the method yeah. but it you know and these f- sheep farmers are doing it and i'm like hmm, i wonder if we can do that and it it works, it works and you you know i'm buying i'm buying i'm buying butchery books yeah. from the 1800s and just reading this stuff because i think it's a lost art and we've got into this this fast food idea of just like slice dice grind let's go but you look at what these old timers were doing. You look at what these the processors of the past were were actually doing, and it's mind blowing the respect that they had towards these animals. And you know, because again, that's all they ate. They couldn't go to McDonald's. Mm-hmm. They couldn't go to you know Whataburger or, or In and Out. This this was their food, and I don't know. That's why I'm excited to get in there. And you know, just like with the gutting, I told you I've become like a little kid in a candy shop, playing around with guts. And telling you all how everything works and telling you the mechanics of it and wait till I start getting cuts on on the meat. It's I love looking at something and imagining what it can be. Um, people often ask me when I do interviews and magazines and stuff, like when a deer comes in, what are you thinking? I go about twelve or thirteen different recipes. <laughs> 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 like I'm not I'm not thinking about like, okay, where's the shot? I'm literally going, okay. Like even when I when I shot that buck a couple of days ago in California that we couldn't find literally when he was coming in, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. I want to do this. I'm going to do that. Okay. I'm going to make tamales out of the neck roast. Right. As I'm watching him come walking in, it wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to shoot it. I didn't, that was it. That was what my mind was thinking of. And even like when you guys are hanging up your stuff, I'm just like, Oh, I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. Um, you know, I've got, I've got recipe books with a hundred plus recipes that I still haven't even made. I just write when I'm laying in bed, like, this sounds good. <laughs> well, it's like Matt touched upon earlier. It's like, you know, you've outfitted yourself to go hunting. Yeah. And you think about it. Almost everybody here has outfitted their truck or their vehicle in some way. You know, look at all the clothes you've got on to yeah. be out there and be scent free. And then, you know, whatever, you know, choice of weapon you use, you know, you've got a huge investment in that alone and a blind. And then there's your time. And all of a sudden, after all this, you're going to hand it off to somebody, a processor. I'm not saying that they're not good. There's good ones out there. But then you entrust that into a fellow that just happened to have his door open, and that, that neon sign was lit that day, and you hand it over to him, and you hope and pray that all goes well. Yeah. Well, it's like you've taken this all the way to the nth degree. Why not finish it? Then you kind of give up, yeah. you know, and you hope and you pray. And then when it comes back all ground, you can't ungrind that. Yeah. Not to say, you know, a couple hundred pounds of ground is bad, but it gets old after a minute. You know, so why not invest a little bit of time and gain some knowledge, get some cool tools, and start doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Like you said, if you make a mistake, well, there really is no mistake because you're still going to eat it. You still learn from it. You still learn yeah. from it. And, you know, I don't know how you guys are. I've been, I came out of like a mechanics industry, I got the very first tool. I ever bought. I've got my grandfather's tools. We were talking about in the, in the blind this morning. I got my grandfather's Oh, hammer. that's why you guys didn't shoot a deer this morning. Yeah. <laughs> we talking in the blind. Story <laughs> finally <laughs> comes. Yeah, yeah, we didn't shoot a deer this morning. We were talking about tools. It's of course like, you, you know, were. Yeah. Like those things don't go away. They yeah, yeah. don't wear out. You know, you're not grinding rocks. Hopefully not. 
But, uh, you know, you're going to keep that machine for years and years to come. And literally, you know, you get three deers apiece, you guys with the lease, within one year, you broke even. Mm -hmm. yeah. That next year, you're ahead of the game. And then the year after that, your light here is ahead of the game. And then you sell it used to a buddy <laughs> so he can make his money off of it and you buy an even you bigger and it's just this, like, it's the <laughs> or you just have companies send them to you for yeah. free <laughs> and, then we get it's, it's like, and then you and then you leave them in matt and cody's because i'm like dude i have seven of these so we're like <laughs> yeah we'll take two of them yeah, but, you know what guy doesn't like cool tools and cool shit for our trucks and cars and guns and bows and it's like it's just funny that everybody stops mm -hmm. right well there. and the Our reason the, the reason why is because that's what we're seeing on tv yes that's what all of our idols are doing that's what all no i say we but i don't watch any hunting shows um but i can't tell you how many people you'll sit there and go well cameron haynes does it this way steve Vanella does it this way jim shockey does it this way eva shockey does it this way taylor dury does it this way and it's it's always the other person doing it that way um and you know oh i got to use this bow because this person shoots this bow i have to use this rifle because this person shoots this rifle and I think when it comes down to it, we, we watch them on this TV show and we watch them, the whole process of the hunt, right? They're looking at maps. They're talking about, they're sitting in the blind. Oh, okay, well, what we're going to do is, right? And that, that's talking what it- about tools when they're that blind, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's it's why like they don't that. shoot deer. Yeah. And, but there's this, there's this mentality behind it's, it ends with a grip and grin. All 99% of the TV shows out there end with a grip and grin. There are a lot of them that are introducing a food aspect to it. But it's usually like later on at the end of the show, it's like a little snippet of them like, and look, we made deer chili, which is great. But there's still this giant disconnect because, you know, it's an, it's an hour long show and 55 minutes of it was leading up to that trigger pull. And for me, when I started from field to plate was what happens after the trigger pull. I could care less what you do beforehand. It does take a lot of time and effort. I am a very, very good tracker. I can find the animal. I can get on on the animal. I know where the animal are moving. Except for that one the other day. I was about to say. Mm. Mm. It's because you were with me, and apparently deer don't like you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but did I, hey, no, no, like but, sniff me and run. <laughs> but, did I, but did I get us on the animals the very first night? And, and you can look at all that, and it's, it's important to know what the, what the tracks look like. What a, it, 100%. Mm -hmm. But TV shows end like that, just like everyone thinks marriages should be like on a TV show. Yeah. You know, you watch the, we were watching cooking shows yesterday or two days ago when you guys were all out. Yeah. And I was sitting there and I was literally, you can ask them, I was telling them, okay, next they're going to put in you know, all-purpose flour. All-purpose flour, <laughs> right? And they were do I was just, it just becomes monotonous. It becomes the same exact thing that people are doing. And so when we, as a processor ourselves, it becomes a, a hands-on experience, it becomes more therapeutic. And again, it, it, to me, it becomes more of that spiritual aspect of respecting the animal in every single aspect. I respected it enough to know where it was at. I respected it enough to buy the proper ammo, to make the proper shot placement. Why am I not going to respect it enough to finish this all the way out? Mm -hmm. And when I put it on my plate and I serve my family, there's this aha moment with my kids of like, well, Dad, tell us about the deer. Oh, this is how I shot it, and this is what we did, and you know, okay, awesome. Well, we're eating this, and then they they take that to school. And we live in Orange County, and our kids go to school in Huntington Beach. Like, when my daughter brings squirrel chili, and all her friends want to try it because the squirrel that's different, <laughs> and you know, or she's have you know, she has deer pastrami sandwiches, and her friends are like, you know, she had I, she took a bunch of uh, wild turkey jerky that I made, and. She took a whole bag full, and she goes, I didn't even get a piece of it, Dad. <laughs> they were like, you know, scavengers on my bag once I told them that it was wild turkey. They were, and so it's funny because even these little kids want real food. It's true. My kid's yeah. one of those little scavengers. Yeah, your she daughter steals my, my daughter's food. Totally. She's, <laughs> a, she's a turkey jerky bully. And so it's just it's funny that these kids, it's sort of like we talked about, like kids want discipline, right? Structure. There's, there, yeah. there's a teacher at my youngest daughter's school, and she's their music teacher, but she is – very very mean. you know mean in a parent's eyes but the kids all love her because she's structured and she has this and when it comes down to being wild game and to do you know the butchering process of it we need to have that structure we need to have that ability to do it ourselves feel comfortable so when we do teach our kids like my kids can get in there and start doing it 
like we shoot dove. My daughter's already plucking, skinning, gutting before, before anyone. I'm like, oh, hold on, leave a wing on. You know, we're we're gonna eat it. I go, yeah, but we're not eating it right now. <laughs> Get travel. And <laughs> and so it's it's fun to see them and to, and and then to see my kids. I mean, I got a 12 year old and a nine year old, and they're teaching adults how to do things mm-hmm. when it comes mm-hmm. to the animals. And again, these are just little Southern California surf kids, who who found out that real life isn't you know a cheeseburger. Um, it it it's a deer burger. You know. And to have your kids be a part of the recipes when you're developing them and writing them. We've been, you know, I think I was telling Matt and Cody, my uh, my daughters act like they're food critics when I put a new recipe down. Literally, they get a piece of paper. They're like, all right, so today, we're, tell us about this recipe, Dad. And they're like writing down. They're like, okay, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a little salty. So we, they write down salty. <laughs> and then afterward, they're like, okay, Dad, your score is, you know, three and a half out of five stars. I'm like, you suck. I thought it was delicious. <laughs> the worst critics there are. Um, but they're honest. That's, they're honest. That's part about yeah, it. Yeah. They don't hold back. Yeah, they'll be honest. But I think for you guys, it. it'll be cool to take that home and share that mm-hmm. experience and share the whole process with their kids, with, with your kids, and show them this this well, idea of hunting. Well, do you think that people like take their food, their meat to the processor because that's just what everybody's done? Yeah, that's kind of like what you were saying. It's what we're it's taught. Easy. I, yeah. yeah. The, the Texas style is. And I'm guilty of it. It's what we did. It's what we were taught. It's what our dad was taught. It's what our grandpa did. It's what he was taught. You get your deer here after the guts are out. You quarter it. Throw it in a cooler. Pour a bunch of ice on it. Take it home for three days. You drain drain the bloody water. Put new ice on it. Drain the water. Put new ice. You're cold blanching your meat. So when you take that meat out, it's gray. Like There's no color to it. It's not, it's not the deer you shot anymore. All that flavor, all that... "Quote unquote gamey," you just hashtag embrace the gamey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, you're you're washing all the flavor out of it, the wild fl- the wild taste, the wild flavor. By doing that, I mean you're getting rid of it. But that's what we were taught, you know, completely getting rid of it. That's interesting because literally two weeks ago, a friend of mine from Texas told you to do that. Told me to do that. Yeah, don't do that. But <laughs> yesterday, you with, when you were cooking close. lunch. And you had you put the Winchester sauce in there and yeah. a little chupacabra on it, and then just that raw deer meat sitting there, I couldn't resist. Yeah, it's good, you know. And I took that, and ate it like absolutely pure, absolutely clean. I'm not suggesting everybody should do that. It's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, but I like raw stuff, and it was it's amazing how good it was. No, and I and I've talked to you know. I can't tell you at least 400 people doing classes, but plus that more in shows and videos and, you know, media hunts and whatever else you do. And the number one response people get back is I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. I I don't have the time to do that. You had the time to go to the bow range every single day this week for an hour and a half. You had the time to sit in a blind for five days for five hours a day. You had the time to drive out and go to your deer lease. You had the, you had all this time that you can't take an hour and a half to pro- – I mean, once you get good at it, I can – I literally can break down a deer in 45 minutes from start to finish in every single cut. Yeah. You don't have an extra hour to do it. That's an excuse, and that's, that's, that's BS. And I don't care who you are what you are. If you don't have the time to do it yourself, then you don't have the time to go out there and hunt. Well, that's just part of that investment we were chatting about earlier. Yeah, it's and like it's – You start and you get all the way to the goal line, then you just give up. But that's it's 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 an excuse. It's Correct. I don't have the time. Correct. I don't know what I'm doing, and and that's another thing too is a lot of people just don't know. Yeah. And they don't want to know. It's because it's something else they have to learn, or something else that they want to have to buy. That they'd rather go spend drop eighteen hundred dollars on a new gun that's going to sit in their safe. Yeah. Than to spend eighteen hundred dollars on outfitting themselves into processing gear. They're afraid to fail. Yeah, I think it's also a, just a measure of convenience for a lot of people. I mean, that's what this world is right now. You know, get it fast, get it quick, as easy as I can. Instant gratification. Yeah, right I mean, that goes around. not just for this, but, you know, for all aspects of life for the most part. You know, it's the people that put in the work that reap the benefits, you know, and I, from harvesting a deer to going to the gym, for example. I mean, it's... It's Hold on, wait. It. We don't go to the gym. We don't. Yeah, high five. <laughs> I don't put in the work there. We're so. all looking at each other like, any yeah. you guys ever seen a gym inside? Yeah. 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 My brother, my brother-in-law's name. Na- yeah, my brother-in-law's name is Jim. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, I, and again, I'm not bashing media or anything, but that's what you see, like what you said, uh, on the TV shows, at the hunting shows, in the magazines. It's all about the bone on the head, not the meat. 
for the most part. Um, and even myself, I mean, I, I struggle. It's kind of an inner argument with myself. You know, I, I'm out there for the meat, but you know, you see that nice rack come out on top of that buck and you just, you know, something in you just wants it, you know, and it's something that I fight with personally, uh, even though if I get, if I get it great. And if I don't, all right. I mean, a doe meat eats just as good as buck meat, you know? So it's something I think is an inner, uh, fight in everybody probably. I, mean, oh, yeah. I can't speak for everybody, but I'm speaking for myself. It's a personal habit that you're going to break starting from this class moving forward, just like the sawing of the meat as you're cutting it and the stomach air hits you in the face. That's, that's a <laughs> bad true. habit that you're going to break. You're going to, I mean, habit broke. <laughs> <laughs> Won't happen again. <laughs> you do it one time, no more. But like, it's one of those habits that you're going to have to unlearn mm -hmm. where it was jealous because Eric over here has no bad habits yet. So <laughs> he doesn't have to learn and unlearn any of that. Mm -hmm. Lucky you. Yeah. But, and that's like the coolest part seeing everyone go from their bad habits to, to doing it for the first time. And you make that cut your first uh, rear quarter, you're going to hack it to pieces. Just go ahead and plan on grinding it. Because it's going to happen. But that second rear quarter that you do, your cuts are going to change significantly because you're going to find yourself like trusting your knife, trusting the long cuts instead of using the tip of your knife and just picking at it. it Man, it sounds like you've listened to me. I might have seen <laughs> one of these classes before. Might have been to one. I think this is what, like our fourth or fifth class we've been to. <laughs> yeah, these are just repeat customers. The only reason they have me here is just so they can learn every single time. I keep yeah, yeah, you can come back. Slow come back learning. again. You can come back as often as you want. That way we don't got to pay to go to it. We're just going <laughs> to, yeah, yeah, come, come use our facility. No, but I think it's, it, it's huge. And it's, don't get me wrong, when I see a big buck, like when that big slick walked out, you know, big, big slick six, those, those are my bread and butter, man. Ugly, just, you know, that, those slick deer. And I love them, but then a big fat doe walks out next to it, and I'm like, "Oh, baby, look at, <laughs> look, look at those thighs," you know. And it's hum -ne, hum -ne, hum -ne, hum -ne. Yeah. yeah. And then I and, and then I've seen that buck over there rutting and fighting. And I'm like, "Yeah," and she's nursing, so she's gonna have fat. You know, it's like this. The idea of food to me, like I don't see that as a deer. Now, I I absolutely hate killing things, and I've said this a million times. The killing of an animal does not excite me, yeah. but I know that it's a necessity, and I know that it's a, something that's happened for thousands and thousands of years this this ideology you know of killing and yes we kill animals mm -hmm. that is what we do there's i'm not i i used to say harvest because i was trying to be pc pc and then i was like you know what no i i killed that deer yeah. and i will harvest its meat once it's dead yeah. and I will, but i i killed that deer you know i shot a black bear in alaska and i started bawling like a freaking baby because this bear came in, we were watching it, and it's just like the camera guy starts crying, the the guide starts guying that you know, or my buddy who was guiding us because he's Alaska, we had to be with him, and they're like going, "Why the hell are you crying?" It's like I hate killing things, but if I'm gonna eat meat, I want to be the one that, that does it. Because again, I walked down the grocery aisles at the grocery store, even like HEB yesterday, and or two days ago, and seeing seventy five people looking at different packages of meat. Nobody knows anything about anything on that grocery aisle. They don't know anything about that cut of steak. They're just looking, going, mm, okay, carne asada. Oh, okay, you know, ribeye. Oh, okay. They don't understand where that animal came from. They don't understand what was eaten, where it lived, how it lived, how it was killed, how it was processed. You know, I did a thing for Times Magazine. An animal touches 50 to 100 things in hands before it gets to your plate when it's in a, when it's in a store. Yeah. That's machines, trucks, cattle beds. You know, conveyor like belts, shit. plastic wraps, people cutting, people trimming, people scraping, you know, getting off the bone shards. 50 things yeah. touched your meal before you got it to your house. And why is that pack of beefsteaks got an ingredients list? <laughs> why, like, why is it not just beef? Beef. 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 Yeah. You know? And so when we, look, when we look at a deer or a turkey or a duck or a quail or an elk or a chucker or a jackrabbit, or a, a you know bony old cottontail, we <laughs> hey be nice to that cottontail. Um, we we look at one hand. Yeah. That's insane to think about. One hand. Yeah. Well, two or one hand and half of a numb hand. 
Um, <laughs> but but we look at we look at the process, and to me, that's what excites me, and that's why like. And I, I had this argument with this with this vegan group one time. They came at me pretty hard, and I was talking to their their head leader, and I go, "Listen, do you have a garden at home?" And she's like, "Yeah, I got a garden at home." I go, "Do you grow vegetables?" "Yeah, I grow vegetables." Tell me about your favorite vegetable. Oh my gosh! So this one time we grew these these carrots, and these carrots came out the size of water bottles. They were the biggest. Most I go, I go, what, did, did, were they the best carrots you've ever had in your entire life? She's like, they were the best carrots I've ever had in my entire life. She's telling me all about these stupid carrots. Mm-hmm. And I go, the excitement you're getting over that carrot for taking the time and effort to do that carrot and grow that carrot and process that carrot and eat that carrot is the same excitement I get when I shoot a turkey. We were talking about turkeys. I go, to me, that's my carrot. That's what I did. She goes, I never thought about it that way. I said, that same excitement you get is what I get. I don't, I go, do you enjoy pulling that carrot out of the ground and killing it? Cause it can't grow anymore. She's like, well, no, I said, right. I don't enjoy killing that Turkey, but we really both enjoy eating what we spent so much time and effort on to get and grow and make sure it was perfect. She's like, I respect that. And so I think if we come at this with a, with a mindset of respect towards the animal and towards each other, it blows people's minds mm-hmm. when hunters come out with respect. Like you'll never see me online bashing anybody i get bashed a ton and 99 percent of it is from within the industry and it's like okay great well i i appreciate it like when i i again you know chris alluded to i couldn't find that mule deer that i shot with a, with a bow and arrow and i can't and i said well that's my tag right i drew blood mm-hmm. blood on the arrow I, in, in california we only get that one tag for the entire season the entire and i said that's my tag how many hunters bashed me on that? Mm-hmm. Well, you didn't find it, so it's not dead. Go shoot another one. Yeah. But it's that, it's that in, we don't know. It's that, yeah, and it's that internal struggle with myself. It's like, I'm not just going to kill to kill. Yeah. That's my tag. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Let's say it just so everybody knows that night, there was what? Five of us. us. Five of us hunted around for about an hour until it got so dark we couldn't. And then what do we do the next morning? Called up other people. Other hunters offered to come in and help us. We even got fish and game in there to we help had us. Fish and game in there, and we hunted around for another two, three two, hours, three hours to find it. And finally, I mean, nobody wanted to give up. I mean, here's guys that don't know each other. Yeah. I mean, Jeremiah and this other fellow met that day because he was sitting in my spot. He was sitting in a spot. <laughs> and nobody I was like, gave I was like you, you see that big ground blind with that stool right there? He's like, yeah. yeah. Nobody Where you're sitting? Until, I made that. Uh, <laughs> until fish and game said, you know what, fellas, I think I think it's safe to call. You guys yesterday did more than most would, and then you added today in as well. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if, if you miss, if you hit, if you can't find it, like put in the hard work. It's yeah. not over. Don't just give up. And I think that was the biggest thing, too, and it really surprised that because that hunter I met, Terrence, out there, he was a bow hunter, and when Fish and Game came out, he's like, Fish and Game's out here? Like, you called them out? I was like, well, he, I'm good friends with him. But when I told him about it, he said, I'm there. He's like, well, aren't you worried about, like, if it's not the right animal? I said, no, I know it's the right animal. Yeah. And, well, what if you can't find it? I said, then we can't find it. But I'm, I'm not scared of my game warden. I respect him. And when he come, and literally we were walking, and he looks at me and goes, you've put in more effort than 99% of the hunters that are going to be out here. He goes, I think it's time to call it because we haven't found any more sign. We can't get it, you know, like, he goes, I think it's time. And so when you have, again, now I have a game warden who's yeah. telling me, it's time. You're good. I'm not going to get it. You know, if he finds that deer a week later yeah. and he knows that that's it, then he knows that, hey, we put in the, as, a, as crazy effort as we can and he's clear and free versus me kind of hiding it, putting it on social media, and then him finding that deer and calling me up saying, hey, what's up, dude? I found this deer. You didn't search. You didn't, yeah. right? And so I think that's where that whole respect comes in, that whole, even Terrence, when he was sitting in my spot, and I walked up, I was going to let him sit there. Mm. I was like, well, he goes, no, it's still your. I was like, yeah, but you know, you were here five minutes before me. It's public land. Yeah. And he's like, no, but you brushed this blind in. You put your seat here. You. I just was like, oh, this is a perfect spot to sit, right? And then I gave him my business card. I was like, hey, if you shoot a deer tonight, call me. We're gonna come search. He goes, you, you know, you the same. And that night he called me. He's like, hey, did you get anything? I told him. He's like, well, what time do I need to be there in the morning? I was like, no, you go hunt in the morning. He's like, nope. What time do I need to be there in the morning? And I think that was that mutual respect of me talking mm-hmm. to him in the field, letting him, you know, get to sit there. Cause he was, he had so much bad, he's like, I have so many bad experiences with, with other hunters. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, there's even that night, there was a guy out there who was quote, quote unquote guiding when he, in an area he shouldn't be guiding. 
And he was a jerk to that same guy, kicking him out of spots, yelling and screaming at him, you know, doing stuff to his truck. And that's an experience that other people look at hunters and see. So if we can come at it with this idea of respect and the, the food aspect of it, I think it really shows character to us and character to our kids. And at the end of the day, if, if my kids don't respect me at the, end of the, at the end of the day, then then I didn't do my job. I could care less about anything else. Yep. It comes down to my kids looking at me at the end of the night, giving me a kiss and respecting me. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I think there's, in any people group, there's – the vast majority of them, I would say, you know, for the most part, you're, you're going to do things ethically. You've got the, the outliers that, you know, spotlight, shoot from the road, you know, do things that they're not supposed to. But, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, a lot of this, I mean, I'm teaching this to my kids. Like, my son's five. This will be the first year he goes to the field with me and actually sits with me in a hunt. I, I don't want them thinking I'm murdering animals. So, I mean, that's what I'm trying to instill into them uh, is that, that sense of, ethics in what we do in where we get our food you know you know just as an example my daughter she was with me when i shot a turkey and she'd never seen that before and you know once we cleaned out and took our meat she insisted you know because everything i've taught them when they've been with me is you know respect the animal if i shoot something and they're with me you know i make sure that when we find that animal we sit there and talk about it for a second what we did you know as crazy as it sounds thank the animal for you know that sacrifice is going to put meat on our table. And, you know, when we when we got that turkey, she insisted, you know, to have a little, you know, quote, funeral for the remains. You know, she went off to the side and did her thing and treated respect, buried the, you know, the carcass. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, she's a big animal lover, but she has been taught, you know, what we're doing, why I'm doing this, that type of thing. And, um, and I think that's something important to, to pass on, not just to kids, but to all hunters, you know, even new guys. So... Yeah, I took out uh, this this girl this one time, and she was almost a vegan. She was an outdoor rider, and she very, you know, because as you guys know, I said, okay, let's pray for dinner. I don't, you know, if you don't pray, you, I don't care, but I do. Um, and that night, she was like, I just, that's so disrespectful for you to make. I said, I told you, you didn't have to bow your head or do anything, but I bless my meals. And so she shoots her deer, dropped it in, in its tracks. We walk out there and I said, okay, I know you're not a big prayer, but I pray over every animal that I'm with that dies. Just happens. You can pray over it or I can pray over it just to bless it. Even if you say, hey, thank you for this animal. It's like, like you were saying, respect that animal because that's just, I think, how we do it. She goes, no, I got this. She sits down. She's like, oh, dear God. And like a 45-minute prayer <laughs> for this girl that is anti-prayer. And then she's sitting there crying. She's like, thank you for that. And I was like, no, th I'm sitting there bawling too like a little baby. I'm like, no, thank you. This girl that didn't want to pray for dinner because it was so much disrespect, when she saw the animal die and the respect for this animal, like, mm. it changes a person. Mm. Like your daughter burying that turkey. She's going to remember that moment for the rest of her life, and she's going to teach it, and it's something that we can learn as, as adults, even if it's a bird. Mm -hmm. You know, it needs to have that respect. You know, when my four-year-old went out in the field the first time, we shot a dove. I remember the first time the dove fell, she walked over to it, looked at it, sat down on the ground, and just held it. And I was like, oh, crap, I created a vegan. You know, like, <laughs> like that's all that ran through my head. And then she sat there. We talked about it. For, I, if you know me, you know that I'm the biggest dove hunter in the world. Like, that is my passion. Birds in general. But dove, just, you can ask Eric. He went out and hunted with me. I mean, 15 minutes, I was done out helping everybody else. Like, it's just, I love, I love dove hunting. And I sat there, and birds are flying over our heads. And everyone's yelling, oh, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, this o'clock, that o'clock. And I couldn't hear any of that. I'm just sitting there having this conversation. And it ended with her going, well, we need a lot more to eat then, huh, Dad? And I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, you better start shooting some more. And then she started running out and picking up. But that was the moment for her. She realized, like, hey, this is our food. I love, I love eating dove. Yeah. And, you know, she's like, well, can we do teriyaki dove breasts? And I was like, you got it, kid. Yeah. Right? Like, anything <laughs> you want. We went that it. night. And so she's – she, I, it sounded like she shot every bird when she's telling the story to my wife, like, well, this one, mom, it came flying over and dad shot it and I almost caught it. And then, and then the dog ran out and got it before I like all because we took the time to sit down, but it's there the, was a, the, yeah, the communication, just talking to all these little people like they're big people. Yeah. 
Because they're the, they're the same. the conversation we had yesterday. Yes, right. I mean, don't don't talk to your kids like they're in the blade in that time. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. No one wants to see nothing last night either. No. No, but, it was yeah, it was like blind <laughs> last night. I wonder, <laughs> wonder why you didn't get it here. It's but, uh, it's just talking to them and exactly. communicating and, and getting them to express like what's going on in their head because inside that head's going a million miles an hour. But as as any parents are listening, I've also taken people out of my classes who came out because they had such a bad experience with their parents mm -hmm. forcing them to shoot something for like one of the ladies her dad when she was like eight years old forced her to go out and shoot squirrels with him shoot that squirrel i don't want to dad shoot that squirrel i don't want to dad. shoot that squirrel she's like i shot it and i just can't bring myself and then she saw these classes she's in her 40s yeah she's like and i've been listening and seeing how you do it and i sat there i said i'm not your dad yeah like we sat in a blind for four days and we had deer all around us she's like i just can't shoot it i was like then let's just watch deer you know, finally, like the last day, she pulled the trigger. And because I kept telling her, I said, I'm not your dad. I don't care if you shoot that animal at all. I don't. You, you paid to come to this class. If you want me to shoot a deer so you can still process it, I'll do that. Because you still want to take on the meat, you still want to learn it. I said, but I don't care if you shoot that deer. You know, the, the vegan kid that I took out, Michael, uh, who's now a hardcore hunter, bought a bird dog. He's out hunting I mean, every week, and he's out hunting, which is crazy. Same deal. He was born and raised in Texas. And for his, like, 12th birthday, his dad took him to a deer party. And like a doe walked out and all six of his friends shot the de deer at the same exact time. Mm. That's, you know, shoot it. Let's have fun. Let's go. He's like, and it, it scarred him that he was a vegetarian. Then he became a vegetarian and a vegan for 21 years because of that moment. Yeah. And then he came out, he wanted to learn how to, he wanted to learn how to dove hunt. I took him out to the dove fields. I remember when he showed up, everyone thought I was nuts. They're like, dude, you, you met a vegan online. You're bringing out to a hunting field and you're giving him a gun. <laughs> um, but it turns out he's one of, he's one of my really good friends now. And, that moment, I remember when he shot his first dove too. He just stared at it. I go, "You good?" Put my gun on safety, put it away, and we had a long conversation about the dove he shot. And then he went out there and filled his thing, and he realized it was, you know, and you, you've seen that video if you follow me for a while. I have it up online, like him taking that first bite of meat in oh, 21 yeah. years. He was like, "This, it, the excitement. This is good." <laughs> you know, you see him and just like the excitement in his eyes. He's like, "Thanks, Jeremiah." Then he, you know. Well, that's the thing too is on a hunt, whatever it is. If you're out hunting, heck, if you're out fishing, the experiences that are going through that day are endless. Yeah. I mean, oh, you can yeah. go out and fish and never catch a fish, never get a nibble, but you're out there fishing. Yeah. You go out there hunting. I mean, good Lord, I've been out hunting for a week eight now. Eight days now. And we've seen animal every day. I've got those two doe were right behind me, what, less than 10 feet away? You know, I've had how many, and I just couldn't get them for whatever reason. You know, yeah. doe were up on a buck day, or buck were up on a doe day. Squeaky chair. You know, squeaky chair. Yeah, the guy talking about his talking about hammer. <laughs> you know, what have yeah. you. But it's like, those were all very successful days, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got to watch yeah. all kinds of stuff run by. You know, yeah. and there, there's a lot more going on than killing that animal. Yeah. And if you don't kill that animal, it's like, well. Yeah, that's a bummer. That's what I'm out here for. That's the end result. That's the main goal. But, man, I come away, and it's like my cup runneth over. This yeah. was mm -hmm. a fantastic hunt. Yeah. You know, I spent hours in a car. Yeah. You know, we're out here talking. There's there's way more positivity than, like, oh, I didn't get my deer. Yeah. You know, and all you sons of guns making fun of me for it. I'll remember <laughs> it. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it, it, it was an epic adventure, you know? And mm -hmm. it's like, that's the point. And when you bring little people out, I mean, I got two girls, they're little girls, you know, and we share this stuff with them and that's the part we got to share. Yep. You know, you go out there and like you said, you force them to do something. Hell, you force me to do something. I'm 50 years old. I'm going to be pissed off. He'll grab you in the middle of the night yeah. and almost punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sneak Been up on there. a man at 2.30 in the morning when you're hiding behind a door. Bad things happen. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag numb hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but all right well i mean like i said i think it's it's fun and it's a good group of guys that we're sitting here with and we're chit-chatting um we got to get over and start knocking out some meat since today is saturday i think i don't even know what day it is saturday, saturday. Yeah. uh we got to start knocking out some meat and getting that that done so uh again thank you guys for coming thank you for being part of this um thank you thanks for having us and no, yeah thank you yeah. and in, in the future, I mean, if you want to be part of one of these classes, they're super easy. They're super fun. Don't be intimidated. Again, we have veteran hunters. We have hunters who don't know, you know, what, what, what a deer looks like up close. 
um, that come through these classes and just don't be intimidated to come hang out, have a good time. Go, well, you know what, you know, Matt knows what they look like or Chris knows what they look like up close. He just can't touch I, one. I, I, I pet him. I give him names. Yeah. <laughs> he just can't kill him. He's but, yeah. I, I think that's the thing. He's they like, look me he's in like, the eye and say, Oh, Get yeah. out of here. That guy's serious. Oh, business. that guy's got a bow. He's, he's, he's going to miss. He's the real deal. <laughs> uh, old squeaky chair. But go ahead and follow along for Field to Plate. Uh, check it out on all your major social media. Um, and it's just a good time to get out there. And I can't wait to share the video uh, of this class when we get done with it all and get back home and get going. So uh, you can sign up. You can actually go to West Texas Outfitters. They have a spot to sign up for a wait list. An email list. An email list to get on there um, since we're doing these classes the next couple of years here. Uh, or you can re reach out to me directly, and we'll throw it up on the website when it is time to come up. Um, and we'll go from there. So, And, again, if you, if you reach out to me and you really want to learn something special or specific, just ask, and we'll do it. Uh, really cool things come down the pipeline with some of this from field to plate stuff, um, some new books, some new videos, some new how tos that are really going to kind of change the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So until next time, my friends, talk to you later.